Welcome to the deep dive. Today, uh, we're going to be diving into something uh, pretty heady. Oh, yeah. Biocentrism. It's a good one. You chose Robert Lance's book, Biocentrism, How Life and Consciousness are the keys to understanding the true nature of the universe mm -hmm. for this deep dive. And uh, It's a long title. It's a really long title. Yeah, it's a mouthful. But buckle up. It's a theory that really kind of flips the script on how we think about the universe, mm. you know? Yeah. Instead of life being this happy little accident. Right. In a pre-existing universe, biocentrism says, Roop. nope, life and consciousness are calling the shots. They create the universe. They're in the driver's seat. Wow. It is a pretty radical idea. Right, you know, yeah. I mean, it challenges a lot of the assumptions that we have about reality. Yeah. But I think that's what makes it so fascinating. Absolutely. Uh. So before we get into the mind-bending details, can you tell us a little bit about Robert Lanza himself? Like, what makes this guy tick? Yeah, so, you know, first off, he's not just some guy with a wild idea. Robert Lanza is a serious scientist. Right. He has some really impressive credentials. Right. He's an American medical doctor. He is a scientist and an author. He's currently the chief scientific officer at Okada Therapeutics. Wow. And he's an adjunct professor at the Wake Forest University School of Medicine. Okay, so we're not talking about some fringe theorist here. This is a guy who's deeply involved in cutting-edge science. So what kind of research does he do? His main areas of expertise are stem cell research cloning and regenerative medicine. He's actually considered a leading figure in these fields. Wow. Um, for example, he and his colleagues were the first to show that you could use nuclear transplantation to actually reverse aging in animals. All on. And generate tissues that are immune compatible. Reverse aging. That sounds like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. I know it does, doesn't it? Yeah. But Lanz is doing it. And that's what I think is so interesting about him. He's not afraid to kind of push the boundaries, ask the big questions. And that's kind of what led him to biocentrism, I yeah. think. You know, I'm starting to see a connection here. If you spend your days figuring out how to regenerate cells and reverse aging, you're probably going to start thinking about the bigger picture, about the nature of life itself. Exactly. Okay. And that's where biocentrism comes in. It takes this idea that life is somehow fundamental to the universe and runs with it. Okay, let's unpack this biocentrism thing a little bit. You said it challenges how we usually think about the universe. What do you mean by that? Well, most of us you know, consciously or not, subscribe to a materialist view of the world. Okay. We think that the universe is made up of matter. It exists out there, independent of us. And that life is just something that happened to emerge within this pre-existing material world. Yeah, I think that's pretty much how I've always thought about it. You know, we're these little beings on this little planet. Yeah. In this vast, indifferent universe. Right. But biocentrism turns that whole picture upside down. Right. It says that the universe isn't this indifferent thing out there. It's mm -hmm. actually a construct of our consciousness. Wait, so you're saying that the universe doesn't exist? Yeah. Unless we're here to observe it? That's the basic idea. Lanza uses the analogy of a movie projector. Okay. Think about how a movie projector works. You have a bunch of still frames on a film strip, right? And the projector shines light through them one after another very quickly. Right. Our brains interpret that rapid sequence of still images as motion, as a flowing story. Okay, I get that. But how does that relate to the universe? Well, biocentrism says that our minds are kind of like the movie projector. They take all these different spatial states and all these different possibilities and weave them together to create our experience of time and space. So instead of us existing in the universe, the universe exists in us. In a way, yes. It's like Lanza says in his book, <laughs> the universe is not external to you. Look at the world around you. It's not out there, independent of your consciousness. Your consciousness brings it into being. That is a mind-blowing concept. So yeah. what you're saying is that if there were no conscious observers, the universe would essentially just be this kind of blurry soup of possibilities. That's a good way to put it. And it's a concept that physicists have been wrestling with for decades especially in the realm of quantum mechanics. Oh, yeah, quantum mechanics. That's the weird stuff with particles that can be in two places at once, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it's one of the areas where biocentrism really starts to get interesting. You see, in quantum mechanics, you have this thing called the observer effect. The observer effect. What's that? It's the idea that the act of observing a quantum system actually influences the system. Okay. Like when you measure the position of an electron... You're not just passively observing it. You're actually forcing it to choose a specific position. So before you look at it, the electron is kind of everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Exactly. Wow. It exists as a probability wave spread out across space. Mm. But the moment you observe it, that wave collapses. 
and the electron chooses a specific location. Okay, I think I'm starting to get this, but how does that tie back to biocentrism? Well, biocentrism takes the observer effect and says that it's not just limited to the quantum world. It applies to the entire universe. So you're saying that our consciousness is literally shaping reality. That's what biocentrism suggests. Hmm. And Lanza uses a lot of examples from everyday life to illustrate this point. Like, think about the classic question. If a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Yeah, I remember pondering that one back in high school. I think most people would say that it does make a sound, even if no one is there to hear it. Right. But biocentrism says, nope. Because sound, as we experience it, requires an observer. It requires an ear to detect the vibrations in the air and a brain to interpret those vibrations as the experience of sound. Without a conscious observer, there are just pressure waves, but no sound. Okay, I see what you're saying. It's a, the difference between a physical phenomenon and our perception of that phenomenon. Exactly. And biocentrism argues that this principle applies to everything we experience. The colors we see, the smells we perceive, even the feeling of solidity. They're not inherent properties of the universe, but rather perceptions that are created by the interaction between the observer and the world. So in a sense, we're not just passive observers of the universe. We're active participants in creating our own reality. That's the heart of biocentrism. And to really understand how it all works, hmm. we need to dive into the seven principles that Lanza outlines in his book. All right, I'm ready for a deep dive into those principles. What's the first one? Well, before we jump into the principles themselves, it's important to understand the foundation that Lanza builds. He argues that our current scientific worldview is based on a fundamental error. We've separated ourselves from the universe, creating this artificial division between observer and observed. Okay, I see where this is going. It's that separation that biocentrism is trying to bridge. But how does it do that? What's the first step in rebuilding our understanding of the universe? That's where the principles come in. And the first one is a real doozy. The first principle of biocentrism states, what we perceive as reality is a process that involves our consciousness. Lanza argues that we've gotten it all backwards. We think that the universe is out there and we're just observing it. But biocentrism says that our consciousness isn't passively observing reality. It's actively creating it. Okay, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. So it's not that the tree doesn't exist when I'm not looking at it. It's that my perception of the tree, my experience of its colors, its texture, its solidity, those things only come into being when my consciousness interacts with it. Exactly. Think about it this way. Imagine a bat using echolocation to navigate. Its reality is built on sound waves bouncing back to it. It perceives the world through sound very different from how we perceive it through sight. So what you're saying is that our senses aren't just windows to an objective reality. They're tools that our consciousness uses to construct our own unique version of reality. That's a great way to put it. And Lanza takes this idea even further with the second principle of biocentrism. Our external and internal perceptions are inextricably intertwined. They are different sides of the same coin and cannot be separated. Okay, break that down for me. What does it mean that our external and internal perceptions are intertwined? Think about how you experience the world. You have your senses, which are taking in information from the outside world, light, sound, smells, and so on. But you also have your thoughts, your emotions, your memories, all of these internal things that are coloring your perception of the external world. So you're saying that there's no clear line between what's out there and what's in here. Exactly. It's all part of the same seamless web of experience that our consciousness is weaving. And this leads us to the third principle, which really gets to the heart of how biocentrism challenges our conventional view of the universe. The behavior of subatomic particles, indeed all particles and objects, is inextricably linked to the presence of an observer. Without the presence of a conscious observer, they at best exist in an undetermined state of probability waves. Okay, now we're getting back to that quantum mechanics stuff. You mentioned probability waves earlier. Can you explain what those are in a way that even I can understand? Imagine an electron not as a tiny ball, but as a wave spread out its location, uncertain until it's observed. It's like, before you look for your keys, they could be anywhere, right? They exist in a state of probability in multiple possible locations at once. But as soon as you look for them, the act of observation, that wave of probability collapses, and you find your keys in a specific spot. So are you saying that subatomic particles are kind of like my keys? They're in this blurry, undefined state until someone looks for them and then they suddenly decide where they are? That's the basic idea. And biocentrism takes this concept and applies it to everything in the universe. It's not just electrons that exist as probability waves. It's everything. Whoa, hold on. Everything. Like tables and chairs and planets and stars. 
Are you saying that none of that stuff is really solid until someone observes it? That's exactly what biocentrism is suggesting. It's a radical departure from our everyday understanding of the world, but it's supported by some pretty mind-blowing experiments in quantum physics. Okay, I'm trying to wrap my head around this. Yeah. So according to biocentrism, the universe is essentially this giant swirling cloud of possibilities. And it's our consciousness that's collapsing those possibilities into the specific reality that we experience. That's a great summary. And it's a concept that's reflected in the fourth principle of biocentrism, which states, without consciousness, matter dwells in an undetermined state of probability. Any universe that could have preceded consciousness only existed in a probability state. So if I understand this correctly, you're saying that there was no before consciousness, only a sea of potential that collapsed into the universe we know when conscious observers like us came along. Exactly. It challenges the traditional Big Bang theory where everything explodes into being from a singularity. Instead, biocentrism suggests consciousness is the catalyst that brought the universe into being. This is really making me question everything I thought I knew about reality. And it also makes those first four principles even more mind-boggling. The next principle challenges another one of our basic assumptions about the universe, our perception of time. It states, time does not exist independently of the life that notices it. Time is the process by which we perceive changes in the universe. Okay, so you're saying time isn't this linear, objective thing flowing from past to future. Not according to biocentrism. Time is a construct of our consciousness, a way of organizing and sequencing our perceptions of change. It's like watching a film. The film is made up of individual frames, but our minds perceive it as a smooth, continuous story unfolding in time. In reality, it's just a series of still images. So time is just a construct of our minds. Does that mean the past and future don't really exist? That's where it gets really interesting. Biocentrism suggests that the past and future aren't fixed absolute points, but are actually fluid and intertwined with the present. Remember how we were talking about subatomic particles existing as probability waves? Well, biocentrism suggests that the same principle applies to time. It's all part of this interconnected web of possibilities that our consciousness is constantly navigating. Wait, are you saying that the past can change based on what we do in the present? That's one of the mind-bending implications of biocentrism. It ties into the idea of quantum entanglement, where two particles are linked in a way that they affect each other instantaneously, regardless of distance. Experiments have shown that observing the state of one entangled particle can retroactively influence the state of the other, even if they are light years apart. Hold on. Are you saying that what I do right now can affect something that happened yesterday? It's a wild thought, isn't it? Biocentrism suggests that time isn't as straightforward as we think. If our consciousness is the ultimate reality, then the past, present, and future might be far more fluid and interconnected than we imagine. Okay, I need a minute to process this. It's like you're saying that the whole universe is a giant choose-your-own-adventure book, and our consciousness is the reader making choices that shape the story as we go along. That's a fantastic analogy. It captures the essence of biocentrism. And it brings us to the sixth principle, which challenges our perception of space. Space, like time, is not an object or the thing. Space is another form of our animal understanding and does not have an independent reality. We carry space and time around with us like turtles with shells. So just like time, space isn't this vast objective arena in which everything exists. That's right. Biocentrism proposes that space, like time, is a form of perception. It's the way our minds create separation and distance between objects. But if space isn't real, what about all the galaxies and stars we observe through telescopes? They seem pretty far away. That's our perception, shaped by our senses and our understanding of the universe. Lanza argues that those distances aren't absolute. They're relative to the observer. He points out that even physicists recognize that space can warp and bend under the influence of gravity. So what seems like a vast distance to us might be something completely different from another perspective. So you're saying that the universe might not be as big and empty as we think it is, that it might be more like a hologram where the information is all there, but it's our consciousness that's projecting it outward, creating the illusion of distance and separation. That's a very insightful way to think about it. And it leads us to the seventh and final principle of biocentrism, which is perhaps the most profound and challenging of all. Our connection to the universe is far deeper than we realize. We are not just observers. We are creators. Our consciousness is the ground of being the source from which all things arise. Okay, that one is definitely a lot to unpack. Are you saying that we are literally creating the universe with our minds? That's what biocentrism suggests. It's a bold claim. But Lanza backs it up with a lot of evidence from physics biology and even philosophy. 
And he argues that this realization has profound implications for how we understand everything, from the nature of reality to the meaning of life itself. So we've covered a lot of ground here about how biocentrism challenges our understanding of the universe. Mm -hmm. But what about us? What does this theory have to say about life itself and our place in it? That's where things get really interesting, you know? Biocentrism suggests that life isn't just this random occurrence, you know, in this vast and different universe. Instead, life is fundamental. It's woven into the very fabric of reality. So it's more than just saying we're all connected. It's saying life is essential to how the universe works. Exactly. It's like saying that the universe isn't complete without life, without consciousness. And this has some pretty profound implications for how we think about our own existence, especially when we start to consider the big question of death. Yeah, death. The ultimate mystery, right? What happens to us when we die? Does biocentrism offer any insights into that? You know how we usually think of death as this absolute end, a complete cessation of existence? Well, biocentrism challenges that notion. Remember, if consciousness is fundamental and not limited by time and space, then the idea of a final ending becomes much less certain. So are you saying that biocentrism suggests some form of afterlife? Well, Lanza doesn't necessarily use the term afterlife, you know, which carries a lot of religious baggage. Instead, he talks about the continuity of consciousness, the idea that the energy that makes up our awareness doesn't just vanish when we die. Okay, so where does that energy go? What happens to our consciousness? Well, Lanza draws a parallel with the laws of physics, specifically the law of conservation of energy, which states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed, only transformed from one form to another. He suggests that since everything in the universe is ultimately energy from the smallest subatomic particle to the largest star, and our bodies are energy, our thoughts are energy, then our consciousness, that sense of self-awareness, is also a form of energy. So when our physical bodies die, the energy of our consciousness doesn't just dissipate. It has to continue in some form. That's the implication. Lanza suggests that this energy might return to a kind of universal consciousness, a field of pure potentiality, or perhaps even transition to another reality, another dimension of existence. Whoa, that's a lot to take in. So death might not be an ending, but a transformation, a shift to a different state of being. Kind of like how caterpillars transform into butterflies. It's a compelling analogy, isn't it? And it's a perspective that resonates with ancient spiritual traditions that talk about reincarnation or the transmigration of souls. It's definitely giving me a lot to think about. It's both exciting and a bit terrifying to think that our consciousness might be so vast and interconnected. It's a perspective that can be liberating too. You know, yeah. if death is not the end, if our consciousness continues in some form, then we can approach life with less fear and more wonder. It's a perspective that definitely invites us to re-examine our relationship with life, death, and the universe itself. Exactly. Biocentrism challenges the materialist worldview that has dominated Western thought for centuries. It offers a new way of understanding our place in the cosmos, one that recognizes the profound interconnectedness of life and consciousness. Well, this deep dive has definitely lived up to its name. Mm. It's been a wild ride through the mind-bending world of biocentrism, and I'm going to need some time to digest all of this. It's a lot to take in, for sure. But even if you don't fully embrace every aspect of biocentrism, I think it offers a valuable invitation to question our assumptions, expand our thinking, and approach the mysteries of the universe with a sense of awe and wonder. I couldn't agree more. This has been an eye-opening exploration of a theory that has the potential to reshape our understanding of reality itself. And who knows, maybe one day biocentrism will move from the fringes of scientific thought into the mainstream, revolutionizing how we view the universe and our place within it. Well, until then, I think it's up to each of us to continue exploring, questioning, and diving deep into the mysteries that surround us. Absolutely. And who knows what incredible discoveries await us on the other side of those mysteries. That's the beauty of it, isn't it? The universe is full of infinite possibilities, and we're just beginning to scratch the surface of understanding its true nature. So keep questioning, keep exploring, and keep diving deep. Until next time, fellow explorers.